أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب إلهنا وطبيب نفوسنا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين المنتجبين المطهرين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين روحي وأرواح العالمين له الفداء ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين إلى قيام يوم الدين أما بعد قال الله تبارك وتعالى فستذكرون ما أقول لكم وأفوض أمري إلى الله إن الله بصير بالعباد Dear brothers and sisters سلام عليكم ورحمة الله I'll come back to this verse just to quickly translate it. The verse that I read right now is a verse from the 40th chapter of the Holy Quran. There's somebody from the family of Fir'aun who was a believer. The same Fir'aun at the time of Prophet Musa alayhi salam. In this 40th chapter of the Quran, Surah Ghafir, also known as Surah Mu'min, there's a long conversation where this Mu'min from the family of Fir'aun is admonishing and reminding and trying to advise his people, the people of Fir'aun. At the end of it, he says, فَسَتَذْكُرُونَ مَا أَقُولُ لَكُمْ وَأُفَوُّضُ أَمْرِي إِلَى اللَّهِ That one day you're going to know that what I told you was the right thing, basically. He says, you will remember what I'm telling you, but I've done my duty and I entrust my affair to Allah. أُفَوُّضُ أَمْرِي إِلَى اللَّهِ Inshallah, we'll come back to this concept of tafweed. We want to talk a little bit about tafweed today. But first of all, just to kind of remind ourselves about the importance of these gatherings, the blessing that we have in these days and nights to remember Abi Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam, to connect to Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. I thought I would start with another narration. It is narrated in an important book of Arabic literature called Al-Aghani. Al-Aghani means the songs. Okay, this was written by a scholar of Arabic who lived in the Ghaybat al-Sughra period. He was apparently a Shia, Abu al-Faraj al-Isfahani. But he was an expert in history, in Arabic, and so out of his love for Arabic, he compiled this huge encyclopedia of all the poets and musicians in the history of the Arabic language. He lived in the third century, so the period of before Islam, early Islam, and so on and so forth. Anyways, in that, in that important book of history and of literature, there's one account of somebody called Sayyid al-Himyari, one of the Shia, one of the companions of the sixth Imam alayhi salam. It is narrated that once somebody else is narrating the story that he was in the presence of Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. So this other companion is saying, I was in the presence of the Imam when the, uh, the kind of uh, the guard or the person who's like at the door of the Imam's house, the person working for the Imam, he came to seek permission from the Imam that Sayyid al-Himyari, this Shia, this poet wants to enter. So the Imam gives him permission. And then the Imam asks him to recite poetry. And Sayyid al Himyari begins this famous poem Umrur ala jadath al Hussein faqul li zakiya. Sayyid al Himyari has this poem where he's telling the Za'ir of Abi Abdullah, the person who has been blessed with the opportunity of going to Karbala, 
that go to that grave of Hussein and say to those pure bones that, O oh bones, there will never cease to be clouds of water that are pouring down on you. Meaning people will never cease to cry for you. And we, I'll just read a kind of translation that the po poem goes on that when you pass by that grave, then stop there and wait for a long time and cry for that pure man who was the son of a pure man and a pure woman. Cry like a, a mother who has lost her only child. Yes, so this was the poem that one of the Shia, Sayyid al-Hamyari, is reciting in the presence of Imam Sadiq. And the other person narrating the story says that I saw that Imam Sadiq was beginning to cry. The tears were going down his blessed cheeks. <clears throat> and even from the, 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 the house, actually prior to beginning the poem, Imam Sadiq had told his family to come. The ladies of his family were behind a curtain or behind a door and they were listening to the poetry as well. And the, the voices of their crying all was raised. Okay, so this is an account of an incident that happened that is there in books of history, books of Arabic literature. In our own Shia books of Hadith, we have a similar incident as well, that one of the companions of Imam Sadiq called Harun al-Makfuf, he comes to the presence of Imam Harun al-Makfuf, and again, Imam tells him, okay, you're a poet, recite some poetry. And he recites different poems. One of the poems is that same poem of Sayyid al-Himyari. And here at this point, the Imam cries, and then he tells Harun al-Makfuf an important hadith, where he says, O oh, oh Harun, O oh, oh, Abba Harun, whoever recites poetry for Hussein alayhi salam, and he makes 10 people cry, then that person is definitely going to go to paradise. Falahul Jannah. And then Imam Sadiq starts to reduce one by one, saying that no, even if he just makes nine people cry, even if he just makes eight people cry, until he reaches one person, and he says, no, not even that. Whoever remembers Hussein ibn Ali and himself cries, then definitely this person is going to go to Jannah. Sallallahu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. So just a, a reminder for you dear brothers and sisters that you know as much as we can we should value this opportunity we have whatever we do to give thanks for this blessing we have of the connection inshallah to the Ahlul Bayt whatever we do is let little nothing can compare to this blessing that we have in our life inshallah that we can remember the Ahlul Bayt we can connect to them why? Why is it so important to remember the Ahlul Bayt, to connect to them? Because they are the ones who can give us that guidance we need to succeed in this world and the hereafter. They are the true interpreters of the Qur'an. Those who study Islamic beliefs will come to realize how confused Muslims were. This is just Islamic beliefs let alone jurisprudence and let alone exegesis, tafsir of the Qur'an, other fields, how much confusion did the Muslims fall into because they left the door of the Ahlul Bayt alayhim as -salam? Because they didn't go to those true interpreters of the word of Allah, that true divine source of knowledge. So alhamdulillah, we have a lot to, we have everything that we owe them. The least we can do is to value these nights, to take these nights seriously, to gather together, venerate, honor these commemorations, and remember Imam al Hussein, inshallah. By the grace of Allah, in the last couple of nights, we started talking about different pieces of advice that Islam gives us, or we can say that Imam al Hussein, the maktab, the school of Imam al Hussein, would teach us with the hope that inshallah by learning these practical pieces of advice we can then implement it in our life and it can be one example of those teachings that I just mentioned those extremely valuable teachings that if we were to only live our lives in accordance to those teachings we would succeed in this world and in the hereafter I, we gave this uh, one hadith as an example that where Imam Hussein alayhi salam was when he was leaving the city of Medina, he wrote a letter, Min al Hussein ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib ila Bani Hashim. He wrote a letter to his family. He said, 
أما بعد فإنه من لحق بي منكم استشهد Whoever joins me is going to be martyred ومن تخلف لم يبلغ مبلغ الفتح والسلام So at that time the path of Imam Hussein was such that whoever joined him was definitely going to be martyred He knew this is what he was going towards But he also gives a warning to those people who do not join up with him. And this is what we want to take seriously, what we want to take to heart, what we want to try to live our lives in accordance to, or taking care of this warning, that whoever does not join with Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he's not going to be a successful person either. She's not going to be a successful person. So inshallah, this was our kind of impetus, this was our encouragement that we want to learn the teachings of Imam al Hussein so that we can join his caravan. We can be part of the salvation, the ship that uh, attains salvation because the captain of that ship is Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. And so in, in this regard, we talked about two important aspects of the teachings of Imam Hussein, the teachings of Islam. One was that we want to be people who give thanks, who are thankful, positive people. When we have blessings, as we all do, we want to focus on those blessings, remember them, spend some time thinking about them, thanking God both with our tongue and more importantly, through our actions. By living a life of servitude to God, we want to say thank you to Him. We talked about this in detail. And then the second thing we talked about was that we want to be people who think and ponder. Unfortunately, most people, if you go and look at it, they live their lives, they, they more wake up in the morning and go to sleep at night without putting aside time to think about what they are doing, where they came from, where they are going, how they are spending their time, how many lofty levels of perfection in this world and the hereafter can we attain if we were to only think about what we should be doing and make a plan for ourselves and then strive to implement that. So this was the second kind of point that we talked about yesterday. Inshallah, we want to go on from that today to add a third point. That, that is this concept that I mentioned in that verse of Quran. That is the concept of tafweed. That we want to be people who entrust our affair to Allah. We give everything basically, we, we rely, let's say we rely on Allah to take care of our affairs. And inshallah we want to explain exactly what that means, that we don't get the wrong understanding of it. But all of these three points, the one that we started with on the first night about giving thanks, the one we did yesterday about being somebody who thinks and ponders and uh, takes account, okay? And even this third one today of entrusting our affairs to Allah, in a sense, all of these three points have a common problem that they are addressing. All of these three points are very much related to living a life of going through difficulty in this world. We can say that these are Islamic solutions, my dear brothers and sisters, for mental health, for depression. Islam has a lot to say about these things. Islam has teachings that if we were to only go to Islam and learn it, we would come to realize how much there is to offer in this religion. As opposed to people who look at just the materialistic, physical, at the very most emotional aspect of a human being, Islam is giving us solutions to our problems that looks at our spirit as well. That looks at both this world and the hereafter. For example, it's likely that if you were to go to somebody who does not believe in the spirit, who does not believe in the soul, in the hereafter, and you were to ask them for advice about how to deal with difficulty, this materialistic, atheistic perspective may lead them to say something like the following, that, okay, just focus on happy things. Somehow ignore your problems. Go on vacation. Enjoy something pleasurable in this world. And that will try to erase the problem, okay? Avoid the problem. 
that's, that's something that might temporarily help us. I'm not saying that the uh, Western psychology atheists don't have anything to offer. No, they may have wise, even useful, beneficial points. But Islam is approaching things very differently. When we look at Islam, Islam is telling us no. We have to somehow realize that the world is a world of difficulty. We cannot expect everything to always go the way we want it to go. Okay, we can't just erase every problem in our lives. We take a logic, of course we have to. God wants us to take a logical, take a permissible halal approach to dealing with our problems. If I get sick, I go to the doctor. <laughs> If my car breaks down, I call Brother Rayyan there and he, he gives me a ride. No, I go to the mechanic and he fix my car, fixes my car, inshallah. But the point is that beyond that, there we have to realize Allah is telling us, Islam is telling us we have to realize that there are going to be certain problems that I cannot get rid of in my life. There are going to be people who I have to interact with in my day-to-day -day life. Whether I like it or not, they're not going to always be polite to me. They're not gonna always respect me. I'm gonna have to work with people, live with people who are gonna be difficult. And in that, there is a test from God. You see, Allah is training us that whatever happens to us in our life is an opportunity. And if we look at it with that monotheistic lens, we approach it in that manner that this is God's test, this is an opportunity for me to Become somebody who has patience. Become somebody who has tolerance. If everybody had a perfect life, then there would be no difference between somebody who has patience and somebody who doesn't have patience. God wants to test us. God wants us to realize that there is a goal in all of these difficulties that he is giving us. So this is connected. It's both connected to this idea of thinking that we talked about yesterday that we want to be people who stop and, and think about our lives. What's happening to us? Where are we going? What should we be doing? Okay, and it's also connected to this concept of tafweed that I'm going to explain right now. Uh, but just before that, let, let's look at one narration from Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Sallallahu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. that illustrates or mentions this exact point that I just said. So in the end of Dua Al-Arafah, Dua of the Day of Arafah, which is a very, very beautiful, very important and very long, extremely long Dua that we have from Imam Hussein alayhi salam, at the, towards the end of it in one place he says, Ilahi, alimtu bi ikhtilaf al-athar wa tanakkulat al-atwar أن مرادك مني أن تتعرف إلي في كل شيء. He's saying, Oh God, I came to realize Imam Hussein عليه السلام at that pinnacle of spirituality, somebody immersed in the love of God. How does he talk to Allah Taala? One of the things that he says to Allah is, Oh Allah, Oh God, I know or I came to know by the changing of my circumstances. The athar, the atwar, the effects, my situation, my state in my life. Sometimes I was in, in a good state, sometimes in a hard state. Sometimes I had ease, sometimes I had difficulty. Sometimes I had health, sometimes I had sickness. With all of these changes, I came to know that you wanted to show me yourself. In everything that happened, you wanted to show yourself to me. What does that mean? It's this point that I was just saying, that whatever happens in our lives is from God, is an opportunity. God's will is somehow, I indicated this a few days ago, yesterday or the day before as well, that people's will is not something as opposed to the will of God. Today when the oppressors are killing Muslims or killing innocent people around the world, of course, they are responsible. They, we need to take them to account for that. We need to resist it. And we need to, they are going to go to hell if they don't change their ways. Definitely all that is there. But in one sense also, this is a test for Muslims that I'll, I'll come back to towards the end of today's lecture, inshallah. That we also need to look at everything as being a test from God. And this is what Imam Hussein alayhi salam is telling us in this line. That whatever happens to us in our lives, God wants to manifest himself show himself to us. 
we need to realize that the dunya is not a place where everything is going to go the way we want it to go. Okay, so what does that have to do with this idea of tafweed? Tafweed, like I said, is this idea of somehow entrusting our affairs, handing over our affairs, our matters, our life, handing it over to God, making God be in charge of everything. Inshallah, you guys are with me and it's not too. Sallallahu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Now we don't want to get, when we say that tafweed is a very good thing, it's a value in Islam, it's something we want to try to have. I, I quoted that verse of Quran where the mu'min of the family of Fir'aun was saying, Ufawwudu amri ilallah. I entrust my affairs to Allah. We don't want to get the wrong idea of what that means. It doesn't mean that we don't work hard. It's like, no, I'm going to just sit at home and be like, God is in charge of everything. I don't need to try to fix my problems. I'm going to just sit at home and pray and inshallah other people, or God will just send me whatever I need. I need money, God is just going to send that money to me. No, obviously that's not what it means. Okay, there is a system of cause and effect but we have to understand that system of cause and effect. Part of the system of cause and effect is my own efforts. I need to work hard. I need to use my free will. But I have to realize the system of cause and effect encompasses a lot more as well. One of the things that will increase my sustenance in this world is if I treat my parents well. One of the things that will increase my sustenance is if I give sadaqah. We have a hadith about these things. We have real life experiences people have seen about this as well. And so there is a complicated overall arcing kind of system of cause and effect in which part of it is our own free will. And so we need to do what our responsibility is and then once we have done our responsibility, once we know between me and God, I did whatever I could do. Okay, then I have to just trust on God. I have to ufawwudu amri ilallah. I have to do this thing of tafweed. And then I have to know that whatever happens is going to be good for me because I did my responsibility. Does that mean that I'm always going to win in life? No, I might not win. Apparently, I might lose. Apparently, Imam Hussein alayhi was killed, right? He didn't apparently win in this fight against Yazid. But he did whatever he had to do. He did his responsibility to Allah. And in that sense, whatever happened was definitely good for him. We have a verse of Quran talking about warfare in Surah At-Tawbah, talking about jihad, where it says, قُلْ هَلْ تَرَبَّصُونَ بِنَا إِلَّا إِحْدَ الْحُسْنَيَيْنِ See, Muslims who go to the battlefield, who perform the lesser jihad, this is their outlook. That there is one of two options, إِحْدَ الْحُسْنَيَيْنِ No third option is there. Either they will be victorious, they will win in this fight, or they will achieve shahada. They will be martyred and they will have such a high reward in the hereafter. Why? Because they did their responsibility. And this is a lesson for us to take, that if we do our responsibility, we can then just rely on God and entrust our matter to Allah and know that whatever happens to us will definitely be good for us. Of course, at times that's easier said than done. We need to be people who, who work hard, people who know, have knowledge. Like let's say we have a very complicated situation. I'm juggling family commitments and work commitments and masjid commitments and family encompasses different family members who don't get along with one another. And so for me, how do I act in this complicated situation? What does God want me to do? It's not always that easy. It needs, like I said yesterday, it needs time to ponder, to take advice, to learn what our responsibility is. But then once we've learned what it is, we go ahead and do it with strength and, and tawakkul on God. We do this idea of tafweed, where we entrust our affairs to Allah. And so as we move, inshallah, to the end and to the musibah, I wanted to just talk a little bit again about Palestine and, and what's happening in the Muslim world today. <clears throat> this unparalleled scene that we are seeing in front of us, this genocide that now for nine months it has been going on. Like I said two days ago, this is unprecedented. I don't think we have seen such horrible 
barbaric actions in our lives at this scale. Two million people being starved, being bombed, having such a horrible situation. I was reading an article on Al Jazeera where they were talking about the experience of a nurse from California. He's a American, but originally Palestinian. His name is Omar Sahba. Sabha or Sahba, I'm forgetting. May God bless him. He, he became qualified to be a nurse just when this war was starting in October of last year. And for 10 days, only 10 days, he went, I'm saying only 10 days for us who haven't done much at all, like even that's so much. He went for 10 days with some humanitarian agency to go and volunteer in Gaza. This was in the month of Ramadan a few months ago in April. He was there when that um, aid convoy of like foreigners, Europeans was bombed. Okay, and he, he narrates, like he talks about his experience when he came back to America, he's suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. He's like, he's unable to live his life because of the scenes that he saw in those 10 days. For 10 days, he would just eat two protein bars every day, sleep for four hours, and all day he was working in a hospital, performing surgeries on young children who had to have limbs that were ampu amputated. He would see children with like massive burns. He would see the situation where people around him are starving, everything is being bombed, there's no medicine, no facilities, no washrooms that they have. And he is so, so scarred. He's coming back and he's like having nightmares at night and not able to deal with it. This is the situation that we have happening. And so Muslims definitely have a responsibility in this situation to do something. Muslims are strong. Muslims are more than one billion, I don't know, two billion people on this earth. How much of the world population, how much of the wealth of the world is in the hands of the Muslims? And we look at these pathetic Muslim governments, what are they doing? They pass a, a declaration that, oh, there should be a ceasefire. So, well, what, does that, what does that do? What does that mean? You're not, the ceasefire is not in your hands. You make an announcement that there should be a ceasefire. That doesn't do anything. But they could put economic pressure on the Zionist regime to stop what they're doing, and they don't do that. You see, this is because they are not doing their responsibility. If Muslims did their responsibility, and then they did this idea of tafweed, where we have done our responsibility and then we trust in God, then definitely the situation would be very different from what it is today. And so this is something that we need to keep in mind. These are teachings of Islam, teachings of the Quran that we are uh, unfortunately not implementing. I'll, I'll just quote one verse of Quran and then inshallah we move to the musibah. In Surah Mumtahana, one of the, I don't know, 27th juz or 28th juz surahs, it says, إِنَّمَا يَنْهَاكُمُ اللَّهُ عَنِ الَّذِينَ قَاتَلُوكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ وَأَخْرَجُوكُمْ مِنْ دِيَارِكُمْ وَظَاهَرُوا عَلَىٰ إِخْرَاجِكُمْ أَنْ تَوَلَّوْهُمْ وَمَنْ يَتَوَلَّهُمْ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الظَّالِمُونَ If we had time, we could talk more about what this wilayah means. But let me just summarize it right now. تَوَلَّوْهُمْ wilayah. It means this idea of being in the same group the same force, the same kind of party as a certain group of people. When you have wilaya with the Ahlul Bayt, it means you are in their group. You have wilaya with other believers, it means you are one group. Okay, so Allah Ta'ala in this verse, He's telling the believers that God has forbidden you from having wilaya with a certain group of people. Who is this? We are not allowed to have wilaya with those who fight against the Muslims because of their religion those who throw the Muslims out of their houses, those who openly do that, basically. So what better example do we have today than the enemies of Islam that we see who are doing these crimes? And so we are not allowed to have wilaya with these enemies. And unfortunately, Muslims around the world have not acted according to the Qur'an. Otherwise, the situation would be very different from what it is. Sallu ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that inshallah by the sake of Imam al-Hussein we are remembering in these nights he improves the situation of the Muslims. He helps all the oppressed people throughout the world. He cures all of those who are sick, especially from the families of you dear brothers who are, and sisters who have gathered here today. And last but not least, we pray that Allah 
hastens the appearance, hastens the appearance of our Imam Ajallallah Farajahu Sharif, and makes us all from his helpers, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum ya Aba Abdullah. Wa ala la arwa hilati hilat bifina ika. Alaikum minni jami'an salam allahi abadam ma baqitu wa baqiya laylu wa nahar wa la ja'alahu allah akhir al-ahd minni li ziyaratikum السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين Master Mercy, I desire in the name of Al Hussein your forgiveness. I aspire through my tears for Al Hussein. No mantra to take me higher than the name of Al Hussein. No protection from the fire like my love for Al Hussein. Inshallah, my dear brothers and sisters, today and tomorrow, perhaps even on the day of Ashura, we will recount some of the stories of the companions of Imam Al Hussein, alayhi salam. These eminent individuals, these heroes, the likes of whom there are none other before them or after them. Today we want to remember the story of Hur. But before that I thought let me briefly mention two other companions since we don't often get to hear the stories of these great individuals. There were two companions who were very close to one another whose names was, were Shawdab and Abis. Abis ibn Abi Shabib was from a tribe that was called Shakir. Okay, this was a tribe from Yemen. On the other hand, Shawdab is narrated in the books of history as being Mawla, being a Mawla of the tribe of Shakir. So some of the historians made a mistake apparently and they thought that Mawla here means slave. And they thought that Shawdab was a slave of Abis. But actually other historians, more maybe qualified historians and experts in hadith clarified this later. And they said, no, Shawdab is not the slave of Abis. Rather, he was somebody who had an, a pact, an agreement with the tribe of Shakir. That's why he was known as the Mawla of Shakir. In any case, Shawdab was an eminent individual. He was, it is narrated that mutaqaddiman fi shia He was somebody who was at the foremost, one of the scholars, one of the narrators of hadith in the Shia community. On the day of Ashura, Abis comes to him and he asks him, that, O oh, Abis, what are you, O oh, Shodab, sorry, what are you going to do with yourself? And Shodab, as if he's shocked, he says, what am I going to do? Obviously, I'm going to fight. I'm going to defend the son, the son of the daughter of the Prophet of Allah. And Abis is happy. He said, that's what I expected you to do. Shodab goes and he sends salam first to Imam, and then he goes into the battlefield and fights until he is martyred. Abis Ibn Abi Shabib, the other individual, is a very important person. His name comes up in the books of history in multiple places. When Muslim Ibn Aqil came to the city of Kufa, he read a letter of Imam Hussein in the house of Mukhtar al Thaqafi. At this point, the first person to jump forward and declare his loyalty to a Muslim and say that I'm ready to fight, I'm ready to die for you, was the same Abis. Abis on the day of Ashura, he goes and he talks to Imam Hussein after Shodab has been killed. He expresses his loyalty. He tells the Imam, if there was anything else I could have done for you, I would have done it. But the one thing I can do is I can fight, I can give my life. 
Abis goes into the battlefield. One of the enemy members, he sees Abis and he knows how brave an individual Abis is. He calls out to the army of Yazid that, O oh people, this is a lion from the lions. This is the son of Abu Shabib. Nobody should go and fight him. Abis is calling out that, O oh, you soldiers, O oh, army of Yazid, come fight me. Send one by one, send people to fight me. Umar ibn Sa'd calls out to his army that, no, throw stones at Abis. When Abis sees this unmanly action from the army of Yazid, what does he do? He takes off his armor, he throws down his helmet, and he goes and rushes at the enemy with his sword. They narrate that 200 of the enemy soldiers are so scared that they are running away from this Abis. But eventually he is surrounded by all sides and he is martyred. Rahmatullahi alayhima. But today, my dear brothers and sisters, we want to in particularly remember this eminent and important individual, Hur bin Yazid al-Riyahi. Hur is somebody who we all have a lot of affinity to. He is somebody whose story is a very powerful story, a very moving story. He is, in a sense, the one responsible for the tragedy of Karbala. He is somebody, if it was not for him, Imam Hussein was going to the city of Kufa. Maybe the end would have been a very different end had he reached Kufa. And Hur is the one who stops him. That such a bad person, somebody who has done such zulm, all of a sudden he repents and Imam Hussein accepts his repentance. This is a lesson for us, my dear brothers and sisters. No matter what we have done in our lives, if we go to Hussein ibn Ali, this is the house of generosity, magnanimity. This is a, a accept our forgiveness if we seek forgiveness from them. Why was it that Hur did what he did? Why was it that he changed but other people? You know, Umar ibn Sa'ad was also somebody similar who was also not sure what should he do. But what was it that was different about Hur that led to Hur repenting? And Umar, la'anatullah alayhi, did not repent. Maybe one of the things was the adab, the etiquette that he showed in front of the Ahlul Bayt. My dear brothers and sisters, adab. Adab is something so important in our lives with our elders, with our parents, with those people who we owe anything to, with everybody, but especially with those people who we owe things to, like our parents, our teachers, our elders, we need to learn to interact with adab. Where did Hur show his adab? It is narrated that when Imam al Hussein alayhi salam's caravan was going to Kufa, they reach a place called Dhu Husum. When they reach Dhu Husum in the distance, they see an army is approaching them. And that is the army of Hur. Hur was somebody who had been stationed in a city called Qadisiyah. And Ubaidullah bin Ziyad sent somebody to replace him and told him, to, to, told that person that you tell Hur that his job is to go with these 1,000 horsemen and block Hussein. To not allow Hussein ibn Ali to go to Kufa, to arrest Hussein ibn Ali and bring him to me. So as Imam al Hussein alayhi salam with that small caravan of his companions as they are going in the place of Dhu Husum, they come and they meet the army of Hur. Hur's army blocks the passage of Imam Hussein. They are somehow facing off against each other. Hur doesn't want to fight, but his army is blocking the passageway for Imam Hussein. It is the hot afternoon. Imam Hussein quenches the thirst of Hur. There's some beautiful stories here that I won't go into, but Imam Hussein alayhi salam tells his companions to give water and they give water to the army of Hur. The time comes for prayer. Imam Hussein talks to them a little bit, but eventually the time comes for the Dhuhr prayer. At this point, Imam Hussein asks Hur, Aturidu an tusalli bi ashabika? Hur, Hur was the leader of the army. That was what it was like. In those days, politics and religion was one. The leader of the army would be the Imam of Jama'ah. And so Imam Hussein asks him that, Oh Hur, are you going to pray with your army yourself? He says, No, no, how can I do that? La, bal tusalli anta wa nusalli bi salatik. No, oh Hussein, you will pray. You pray and we will pray behind you. This was the adab. He had that respect for the Ahlul Bayt. Again, my dear brothers and sisters, when we look in history, a lot of people didn't have that respect of the Ahlul Bayt. 
There were great scholars, great pious people who considered themselves to be fuqaha and ulama and muhaddithin, but they didn't have that humility in front of the Ahlul Bayt. But Hur, who was a soldier for the enemy, he had that humility. He had that respect for the Ahlul Bayt. Sometime later, after the Asr prayer, Imam Hussein Islam wants to head out. He doesn't want to just sit there. He wants to continue on his way. He tells Hur that, look, he tells the army of Hur and he tells Hur that by Allah, he says that, ayyuhan nas, anyways, I'll just summarize it. He tells them that, look, I'm only coming because you people of Kufa are the ones who invited me. You are the ones who sent me all these letters and told me that, oh, we don't have an imam, come to Kufa, we will pledge allegiance to you. Hur says, I don't know what you're talking about. Imam tells one of his companions, go and bring those letters. And he brings two huge sacks full of like hundreds of letters and he shows it to them. Hur says that, anyways, regardless, I was not the one, we were not the ones who wrote these letters and we have been commanded that we are not allowed to let you continue to Kufa. At that point, the Imam tries to not, tries to disobey Hur and just gets on, tells his soldiers, tells his companions that let us go. But as they want to go, Hur's army blocks the passage of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. At this point, Imam says a sentence to Hur. He says, Thakalatka ummuka. May your, this is like an insult. This is a harsh insult in Arabic. That may your mother weep for you. May your mother grieve for you, O oh Hur. What does Hur say to Imam Hussein? He says, Ama law ghayruka min al Arab yaquluha li wa huwa ala mithli. He said, Oh Hussein, if any other Arab had said that sentence to me, no matter who they were, I would have said something about their mother as well. Anybody else. He said that, Oh, oh Imam Hussein, what can I say about your mother? You see, my brothers and sisters, this respect to the Ahlul Bayt. This adab in front of Fatima al-Zahra was what saved Hur. Let us go, my dear brothers and sisters, to the day of Ashura. The time came on the Asr of Ashura. When Hur bin Yazid al-Riyahi is hearing the cry of Imam, Ama mughithin yughithuna liwajhillah. Is there not anybody left for the sake of Allah to come and defend us? Is there nobody left to come and defend the haram of the Prophet of Allah? Hur goes to Umar ibn Sa'ad and he asks him, are you really going to kill Hussein? Umar ibn Sa'ad says, yes, I am definitely going to. Hur starts to wonder what he is doing. He starts to walk towards the camp of Imam al Hussein. There is somebody, he talks to one of the other soldiers and makes him move aside. And then he is going towards Hussein, shaking. Somebody else comes to him by the name of Muhajir. He looks at Hur and he says, O oh Hur, inna amruka la murib. Your situation, O oh Hur, looks very strange, looks very suspicious. What is this situation? I've never seen you like this before. If anybody had asked me who is the bravest of everybody in Kufa, I would have mentioned you. What is the state that I see you in? Hur says, by Allah, I see myself having to choose now between paradise and hell. By Allah, I will not choose the hellfire. I will not choose anything over paradise. Uh, now he has energy, he's going quickly. He goes quickly on his horse towards Imam al Hussein. He goes, according to one account, with his hands on his head, calling out, Allahumma ilayka anabtu fatub alayya, O oh Allah. I seek your forgiveness. Why, O oh Hur? What is it that you have done? Faqad ar'abtu quloob awliyaika. Hur's 
who is feeling sad about what he has done to these young children of Rasulullah. He says, I have filled the hearts of your awliya, O oh Allah, with fear. I have filled the hearts of the children of the Prophet's daughter with fear. Who comes in front of Imam al Hussein? He apologizes to Imam al Hussein. He tells him, I am the one that did all of this, but now I want to repent for it. He asks Imam al Hussein, Fatara li dhalika. Tawbah, O oh Hussein, is there going to be any forgiveness for me? Nowhere will you see that Imam Hussein hesitated. Right away, Imam al Hussein tells him, Naam, Yatubu Allahu alayk, Fa'anzil. Oh, or definitely God will forgive you. Come down. You, I don't have, maybe he wanted to say, I don't have water to give you. I don't have anything else. But now, or you are our guest. Come down from your horse. According to one account, Hur says, no, don't, I won't come down. He says, I was the first one to cause all these problems to you. Let me now be the first one to go and fight. Hur goes into the battlefield to go and fight the army of Yazid that a few moments earlier he was part of that same army. He calls out reading poetry as he goes into the battlefield. Inni ana al hurru wa ma'awa al dayfi adribu fi a'anaqikum bis sayfi. He says, I am Hur, I am going to fight you with this sword. Alaytu la uqtalu hatta aqtula wa lan usaba al yawma illa muqbila. He says, I have made a vow, I have made a promise that I am not going to be killed until I myself fight and kill some of you enemy. He says, I won't be taken unless it is when I am attacking. I won't be, I won't be stopped, I won't run away basically from the battlefield. Hur fights valiantly, he fights bravely, but the time comes that he falls down, martyred. According to one of the accounts, Imam al Hussein came to him as the blood was flowing, and he said to him, Bakhin, Bakhin, ya Hur, anta hurran, kama summita fil kama summita fil akhirati wa dunya. He said, Congratulations, O oh Hur, indeed you are Hur in this world, in the hereafter, you are a free person. ألا لعنة الله على القوم الظالمين وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي منقلب ينقلبون